It is such a joy. So thank you. Thank you. You are here listening, but um, it is just such a joy to talk about Jesus um, with you this morning. So I just want to thank you for that privilege and uh, trust that our hearts would be truly set on fire for this wonderful, wonderful Savior um, in our lives. So much has happened already this morning that we can thank God for um, in the worship and in things that have been said and the mothers and the women that have been honored so much. And um, I know that Pete, he's, we sang a song, something about Jesus is on the move. And um, I remember reading that the resurrection, actually one of the things it means is that um, Jesus is now alive, he's amongst us, and who knows where he's going, going to be and where he's going to appear in our lives. And um, it's just such a wonderful um, truth that Jesus is alive and he is here with us today. And I do believe he's already been working in some of our lives. And he's, he's got such a beautiful something. He's got a gift to give you today. Not just the mothers on Mother's Day, but he's got a gift for you. We've been doing um, a series through Philippians, so I'm going to dive right in because it's an incredible portion of Scripture, beautiful. Um, it, it reads very easily, and, and a lot of us that have known Jesus for a long time would, would be able to just recite most of it. But it is quite hard to live it, especially in our, um, just in our lives. It's pretty hard to live it. It talks about rejoicing. It talks about not being anxious about anything, um, standing firm in our faith, etc., etc. So let's dive right in. So it's Philippians 4, um, first verse, and it says, therefore, my, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to use my language if that's okay. <laughs> therefore, my darling brothers and sisters, Paul writing to the Philippian church who he absolutely adored. You who I love and I so long for, you are my joy and you are my crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my darling friends. And um, so we have to look, stand firm in the Lord, therefore, um, so then, um, and we look previously, and why is it that we can stand firm in the Lord? What is Paul saying to us? And if we look at what he's actually saying, he's taking it from Philippians 3, where he's saying our citizenship is actually in heaven. Um, and we eagerly await a Savior that is from there, our Lord Jesus Christ. And those words, we eagerly await a Savior, those words are actually means we're on the edge of our seats. And we are standing on our tiptoes, and we cannot wait to see this Jesus. And I don't know about you, but it's the longing of my heart is to see him. And often when I have conversations with people, I ask them, what do you see when you think of Jesus? What do you see when you look at him? Because I want to, I want to see Jesus. And, I, and we see him in, in, our, in the faces of our friends and the, those that we love. We see him in sunrises, and we see him in nature. And, and we see him in our spouses. We see Jesus around us. But I'm sure you like me, where you just want to gaze into his eyes. And you want to see the smile on his face when he looks at you. And you want to feel him tilting your chin up towards him and looking deep into your soul and pouring out his love upon you. We want to see that Jesus. We want to, see that Je we want to know what it feels like to be hugged by him. And to be spoken to, we want to hear his voice. And um, so we are eagerly awaiting the Savior because the Bible says he's coming back. And he's coming back soon because the Bible also says that in a twinkling of an eye, he's going to be with us. And so though, that's the reason why we are able to stand firm in our faith. And Paul is using a few things. He's, he's just addressing a few ways of which... of of um, ways for us to live, and they are standing firm in our faith, being united with our brothers and sisters, putting away our disagreements that might be so real to us and so important to us, but actually in the grand scheme of things, they're not important. And um, he's encouraging us to rejoice in God, he's encouraging us to not to be anxious, he's 
but to pray um, and all these things. And it's because we are eagerly awaiting our Savior and he's coming back soon. I love the scripture that says, though we have not seen him, and that, appear, that, that um, is for all of us. We have not seen him. We love him. We absolutely love you, Lord Jesus. And even though we do not see you now, we believe in you, and we are filled with an inexpressible and, we, and a glorious joy indeed. I just want to take a little moment to say, who is he? Um, he's already been spoken of, sung about today. Um, and who is the Savior? Who is this Jesus who shapes and influences the way that we live and who wants to shape and influence the way that we live today? And um, there are many things that have been written about, about him. So much in the Word, we can spend uh, days um, describing him. Endless, endless descriptions of the Savior of ours. I'm just going to read you a few before I carry on in this letter of Paul. He is radiant. He's dazzling to behold. He will take our breath away. He's outstanding among 10,000. He's the beloved of heaven. He's the king of kings and the Im image of the invisible God. He's the lamb who takes away the sin of the world and takes away your sin and takes away my sin. He's absolutely beautiful in splendor and he's absolutely beautiful in lowliness. Angels love to gaze upon him. He is altogether lovely. He's before all things, and in him, everything holds together. He's our exalted king, he's our beloved, and he, is, and he is coming back soon. And because of this, we are able to cast aside all our bad habits of perhaps not being able to rejoice, our old habits of grumbling, of being anxious, our old habits of, pe of perhaps um, allowing ourselves to feed on on um, offense, um, all those we are able to lay aside because our, he is our coming king and he's coming back soon. Okay, then it says, um, I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche <laughs> to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they've contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with my friend Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are all written in the book of life. Um, f f firstly, I want to talk about, we've, we have heard actually in the series through Philippians, the deep love that Paul has for this Philippian church. And in fact, all the church, whenever he writes, there's so much love. It's as if he, he can't tell them enough how much he loves them. He is lavish. And he is so generous in his words. And um, he goes way beyond the standard of language between friends. It is sad if pride stops us from being lavish in our love for our brothers and sisters. And it's very sad if fear stops us from celebrating one another and pouring out words of affection upon one another. It's very sad if offense comes in and stops us from doing the same. Sometimes it can, it can be fear. It can be I've poured, out, I've poured my heart out and I've been hurt and I just cannot do it again. It's sad, friends, in the light of eternity, in the light of Jesus. And um, I want to just, he, he says, Paul also says a little bit earlier, it's, this is peppered throughout the book of Philippians. He says, God can testify <laughs> how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I just want to do a very quick little exercise. I hope I can do it okay, and I hope that the person I want to speak to is, um, is okay with it, but it's actually, I just want to demonstrate kind of what this would mean like. So Ravi and Vani, I don't want you to stand or anything. I don't even know where you are, but I know that you are here. And um, I just want to say you are an absolute blessing to this community, and we love you. 
Ravi and Vani, I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Ravi, for always, for years, you have called me your sister. And even this morning when I spoke to you and I said to you, I'm preaching, Ravi, and you said, I'm, I'm going to sit and I'm going to pray for you. There you are. <laughs> um, I just want to say that, that you are the most beloved members of this church. We love you and... Uh, we don't want to think about the things that you do, but thank you for the care and the concern that you show for all of us. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for everything that you do and the people that you lead and the joy that you bring to people and the blessing you are. But more than that, we just want to say that we love you for who you are. The cords of love in a community are very, very powerful. I, I want to shift it now and say that Paul... Actually, was, he was a human like you and like me. Yes, sure, he was exemplary. <laughs> he did incredible things that we cannot even hope to begin to achieve. He was an amazing, amazing apostle. But he was, there was nothing, there was n not one divine amount of, um, not one divine attribute in Paul or cell in Paul he was completely human, like you and I. And if Paul, a mere human, was able to say and able to speak in this way to people that are <laughs> just ordinary people, sinful and annoying and beautiful and frustrating um, and having issues, if he was able to speak like that, how much more does God want to speak to you about the love that he has for you? And um, I really would just ask, won't you, won't you make it your own? <laughs> the love of Jesus is the thing that transforms us and changes us. And um, like I say, if Paul could say that, how much more does Jesus say? So this is only the starting point <laughs> that Jesus would say, you are, you are my joy and my crown. How I long for you, um, you whom I love and long for. That's the starting point of what Jesus would say to you. Let's, let's get on to these two women who were obviously having a significant disagreement in the church. Quite surprising that Paul would um, mention them by name. Um, he wasn't afraid to. He wasn't hiding anything. He's... <laughs> For, forever and ever, these two women would be remembered as having had a, probably a significant disagreement for him to bring it up. And we know that in previous preachers on this series that there was an, a problem of disunity in the Philippian church. And it appears that it stems from these two ladies, actually. So it was causing division in the church, um, it was having a destruct destructive impact on the church, threatening to damage what had already been achieved, and it was actually hindering the work, the progress of the work of the gospel going out. It was probably a petty issue. The theologians said it, it, if it, it wasn't a do doctrinal issue, probably a petty issue, and don't we know that they, those are the things that trip us up? And don't we know that that is where the enemy capitalizes? <laughs> and he comes in like a flood. He comes in like cancer. When there, there's a petty, petty issue, and he can cause division amongst the church. Um, it could be it, various things. It could be that your ministry has been overlooked. You as a person, you've been overlooked and someone else has been perhaps between these two ladies. They contended. Paul really honored them because they contended, it says, at his side. So whatever they were doing, they were, they were playing a significant role in the Philippian church. Um, but it could be that one of them was overlooked. It could be that one of their children was being favored above the other. Those are the sort of issues. But if we think of, um, we think of this beautiful gospel of grace and the beautiful gospel of truth and the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ and this Jesus that we're going to see again, um, Paul is saying, let's put it behind you. Let's have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. And I want to read what he said just earlier. 
he said, um, have the same love. Be one in spirit. Be of one mind. Don't do anything out of selfish ambition. Put it behind you. Or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Don't look to your own interests, but look to the interests of others. And you know, he's saying this almost as if it's possible to do it. He's saying you can do it. If you see Jesus, the risen Jesus, you can do this easily. Come now. In your relationship with one another, have the same mind as Jesus. He was in the very nature God, but he made himself to be nothing, and he took on the nature of a servant, took on the nature of a slave. We know that um, a house divided against itself cannot stand. The word tells us that. And so, and so he, Paul is saying, stand firm in unity, my brothers and sisters. Be united. We've got work to do. Be shoulder to shoulder. And actually, this is not only for the good of the church, which, which obviously it is, the good of the church and the gospel going on, but it actually doesn't bless you, Euodia and Syntyche. It doesn't bless you. You can do better than this. Come now. Let's, let's, let's live higher. Let's live deeper. Let's live better. And Paul himself, what's interesting is Paul always worked with others. <laughs> so he didn't take the easy way out. Mo many of us will, you know, it's the easy way out. You just work on your own. But Paul is saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to have co-workers, and I'm going to believe for robust covenantal relationships because we have got treasure inside of us, and it's got to get to the ends of the earth that are broken. Broken world out there, much to do people to reach that are absolutely destitute spiritually and, and physically and with their souls are destitute. They are poor and we've got work to do. And one puts a thousand to flat, but two puts 10,000 to flat. I'm going to work with a team. And um, so he gives us that beautiful example. He asks a co-worker to help. He says, my true companion, please help these two ladies to... to um, to settle their differences and to humble themselves, really. Rejoice in the Lord always. I don't think that's easy to do. Um, and if I had to ask for a show of hands, I'm sure, I'm sure that everyone would put up their hands. The, 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 the difficulty here is always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I say it again, <laughs> rejoice, my people, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is very near to you. The favorite word in this letter actually is joy. We know that it's a joyful letter. It's the most joyful letter in the Bible, the most joyful book in the Bible. Surely you will say there are many circumstances that make it not only difficult, but actually impossible to be happy. But Paul is not saying be happy. He's saying rejoice in the Lord. He, as I've read before, he's the one that takes our breath away. And if we really look at him, we, we will surely rejoice. He's king over every situation that you face. And I'm so glad. And I, it, it, it was... It was such a gift to me to prepare this message. So thank you again. The blessing is mine because I felt like the Lord really helped me as I dug deep, took a deep dive into what does it look like to rejoice in the Lord always? What does it look like to not be anxious about anything? And uh, I feel like he's, he's continuing on that process of transforming me into a more joyful person and a less anxious person. And um, I believe that he wants to do that for every single one of us here today. He's king over every situation, friends. I want to go back to that beautiful scripture that I had begun reading, just in the same book that we're looking at. God exalted Jesus to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name. That is why we can rejoice in him always. At his name, every knee is going to bow, like we sang so beautifully this morning. Every knee is, bow, is going to bow. 
He's the exalted king. He's the victorious king already. We might not see him. We might see terrible things on this earth. But it's not what we see with our physical eyes. It's, it, it's we know that he is risen and he's victorious and he's coming back and we can't wait. In, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and every tongue is going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Um, okay, so that's the reason why we can rejoice in the Lord always because he is beautiful. But I do want to just go to a place where I can show you that there's a great benefit to us for rejoicing in the Lord. It's a very powerful tool for our lives. It's a very powerful activity that we can use in our lives. And um, if we can go to... Um, well, you don't have to go there. I will just read it to you, and you know it anyway. Um, okay, you know the story, because we've been talking about this story in the book of Philippians, because it's where, um, it's the beginning of this church. This church was planted by Paul, and right at the very beginning, and as he began to plant this church, absolute havoc broke out, and he was actually thrown into prison. Um, pretty traumatic situation, but I want to read it because it's powerful, <laughs> and it's a powerful encouragement to rejoice. The crowd attacked Paul and Silas. The magistrate ordered them to be stripped and to be beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were then thrown into prison, and a jailer was commanded to guard them. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and he fastened their feet in the stocks. Whoever's on media, do you have that picture? I just wanted to just give you a little, yeah. So it's a bit of a dramatic picture, but I just wanted to show you what stocks, if any of you don't know what stocks looks like, it's your feet on stocks like that and you can't, you know, there's nothing you can do, you just sit. So there they were, Paul and Silas were in stocks in a prison cell. About midnight, they began praying, and they began singing. They were singing hymns to God, and all the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake, miraculous, powerful, radical. The foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, Every prison door flew open, and every prisoner's chains came loose. The, and friends, I just want to say that, uh, okay, is there anyone amongst us today that needs a suddenly in your life? Is there anyone amongst us that needs your chains to be broken off of you? Is there anyone here that needs your foundations of something that is not good in your life to be absolutely shaken, for an earthquake, a violent earthquake to come and to shake those foundations and to set you free to worship this beautiful God. Do you need that, friends? I do. I really, really do. Let's praise and let's, let's worship. Let's rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, friends, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The word gentleness there means charitable. You're just a gracious person. You actually, you've got this beautiful understanding of the human nature. You understand that there are flaws and there are quirks and there are, that we all have weird disorders. I've got them. I've got them in my family. I've got them. I'm awkward and we, we've got them flaws. <laughs> but you've got this beautiful understanding that each one of us and every one of your friends and every one of your brothers and sisters in, in Christ are flawed. Um, but you have this graciousness. You love them because they are yours. They are the gift that God has given you to love and to cherish. That is what this gentleness means. It's, a, it's, it's showing understanding of our very frail human condition. And it's this kindness to forgive each other of 
of those things. And that's what we want to do to each other and what I want you to do towards, towards me. Can we have that? How beautiful would that be to live like that? And, I, and we do, Red Point. It's an absolute, absolute honor and privilege to be a part of this church. It's an absolute gift to Nick and I to be part of this community. Thank you. Um, okay, so if we go back to Philippians. Do, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, every situation, by prayer and by petition, by supplication. Don't forget to thank. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, my peace, is going to transcend every understanding. It surpasses any understanding, my peace. And it's going to guard your heart. And it's going to guard your mind in Christ Jesus. And a lot of this letter is actually about um, Paul is contending for a healthy Christian mind. Um, and we know that our minds are very powerful. Um, I, I exercise a bit and I know that I'm quite fit and I'm healthy physically, which is wonderful, but I'm not so healthy in my mind and, and I'm, I, I'm having to work on that. We want healthy minds. It's actually even more important to have a Christian mind. The mind of Christ is offered to us and it requires discipline. <laughs> it requires the word. It requires prayer to be able to have the mind of Christ. And he's fighting for that here. Um, we know that, in fact, Michael Eaton says this entire letter is, is about actually cultivating a Christian mind. There are epidemic proportions of anxiety in our day to day amongst young people. And um, we wonder, Paul, how can you say, don't be anxious about anything? Um, but this word, friends, is truth, and this word is life, and this word transforms us. And this word is relevant today as it was in those times two th thousands of years ago. It's relevant to every single age. It's relevant to every single person, every single culture. And Paul is saying, like you can, you can do this. Do not be anxious about anything. And he gives us a way, he gives us, um, oh, sorry, I just want to talk about anxiety for a little moment. It's actually the truth is, is that it's exalting something above Christ. It's making something else superior and making Christ inferior. And so the bottom line, friends, one theologian says, it's actually unconscious blasphemy. That's the hard the hard truth, and um, I remember, just a funny situation, but I remember we were in the office one day, and Nick said something like, I'm worried about something or other, and, uh, <laughs> and I was teasing him, and I said, you mean you're sinning? <laughs> and this, is, this was very tongue-in-cheek, because I've spent a lot of time worrying, and every time I worry, I think I'm sinning, and, and actually we are. We, we, we're elevating something above the truth of what God is telling us and the truth of his goodness and his love and his kindness. And the fact that he says, I've, I've got, I am Lord over every situation. But Paul says, but come, go and pray. And this is not, um, this is not just a quick prayer. We take our time. <laughs> take our time and pray. It involves adoration and worship and setting God as the mighty God that he is. We set that platform and we think about him as the everlasting king. We see the greatness and the majesty. As we go to him in prayer, we're anxious. We are anxious about something. But we go to him in prayer and we say, God, we just we see you for who you are, the majestic God of all, the, the only God, our holy God, our sovereign God, King of kings and Lord of lords. We approach his throne calmly and actually with reverence, friends. Supplication. He says, come with supplication or petition. And what that is, is it actually, it's a beautiful picture of a junior person coming to a senior person, someone that is able to help them. 
or a child coming to a mother. It's basically just saying, I have, I have such need of you. I have absolute dependence on you. That's what supplication is, saying, God, I have, I have need of you. I am coming as a young child, as a, someone lower, an earthly human, an earthly child, but I'm coming to you as, as my heavenly Father. It's not half-hearted prayer, friends. It's passionate prayer. And then present your request to God in everything. Cast your care upon him. Be specific. Tell him what it is. And then leave it with him. Let him take care of it. And let's not forget to be thankful, friends. God loves thankfulness. And uh, um, I think there's just never an end to how thankful we can be to God. And um, let's not be ungrateful souls. So concerned, and this has happened to me when I've been very concerned about things. You can get so concerned with your immediate problems that you forget his past and very gracious dealings in your life. And then you also disregard others who actually have got a much greater need than you have. Um, so friends, I want to take you, I want to take you very quickly to the story of the ten lepers. <laughs> Probably most of you know this. I want to contend for thankfulness because I think we've, we've got a long runway of thankfulness that we can get to. Long runway, ever increasing in our lives. And uh, Jesus, he, um, he was going along somewhere. This is uh, Luke 17. Um, and he said, he called out, an, uh, sorry, he's, <laughs> he saw 10 men who had leprosy. They stood at a distance, because obviously they can't come near, and they called out in a very loud voice, Jesus, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, okay, go, your, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went to show themselves to the priests, they were cleansed of leprosy, a radical miracle. Ten lepers cleansed instantly. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back and he was praising God in a, in a massively loud voice. And he threw himself at the feet of Jesus and could not stop thanking him. And Jesus asked and said, I thought ten were cleansed. Weren't ten cleansed? Because that's what, that's what I wanted, ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has, has not one? One other return to give praise to God except you? So friends, this is a story to encourage us. Let's thank God for his past mercies, what he's done for us. We've got story upon story upon story to tell about the goodness of God in our lives, that everything we have, actually, he's given to us. Um, I started a practice of every evening, either walking around my garden or even walking down the road, and thanking God for three specific things of the day. And I haven't, you know, done it every day, but it's a really beautiful practice of like, God, these three things, these, it's beautiful. Perhaps we wake up in the morning and we just, the first thing we do is thank God. It could be thousands of different ways that you can begin beautiful habits or continue and increase beautiful habits that you already have of, being, of having this thankful God I know that everything that I have You've actually given me everything I have. Nothing, nothing that I have is actually from me. Okay. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. This guarding, this guarding, friends, is actually a military term. This is very interesting for, the, um, this is revelation to me, actually. It might be to you, maybe you know it, but um, there were many, you, uh, Philippi was a Roman colony, and so there were many soldiers in Philippi guarding the area. And so for the Philippian church, it would have been very easy for them to understand this term, because this term, the peace of God will, uh, peace of God will guard your heart, it, it, it's the same as a soldier guarding a piece of territory. And um, we know that that's external, but here God is saying, my peace is going to guard you in your interior, your interior soul. 700 years 
This is incredible, friends. 700 years. For any of you here who are wondering about Jesus, come to him today. <laughs> Say, come and be part and, and come to your beloved. He's real. He's true. 700 years before he was born, this is what Isaiah, a prophet, actually prophesied. He said, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For unto us a child has been born, and unto us a son has been given. And the government <laughs> will be on his shoulders. He is going to be called Wonderful Counselor. He's going to be called Mighty God. He is going to be your everlasting Father, and he's going to be your Prince of Peace. And of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Friends, this government, there's a government. <laughs> he is our ruler, and he is our Lord, and he is our King. And when we obey him, you know, when there is good, godly government in a nation, there is peace. What happens when there is no government in a place? Anarchy. There's absolute anarchy. And there's disunity. And there is lawlessness and chaos. And there is this term that says, let the pe uh, there is a, a verse in the, in the next book, the next letter of the Bible, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let it rule, friends. Let him have dominion over you. Let him have dominion and let the peace of God rule over you. Let him be your rule, your Lord, your ruler. Let him have government. <laughs> let him have government in your life. And the increase of his peace will have will there'll be no end. I missed this a little bit, but I just want to go back because I think it will be helpful. But actually to be anxious means you are being pulled apart. That's what it means. It means that on the one hand, hope is pulling you, and on the other hand, um, just lack of trust and worry is pulling you. You are being pulled into different directions. Fear. It's, it's fear, and it's a feeling of being strangled. Terrible physical side effects and terrible spiritual side effects. So friends, three hundred and sixty four times apparently in the Bible it talks about do not fear or do not be anxious. I find that interesting because I think I wonder, God, is it because right at the fall the beginning with Adam and Eve, anxiety and fear obviously broke out because in a sense there is a scripture for every day of the year and it's just an interesting, you can go and think about that. <laughs> okay, friends, whatever is true, again, again Paul is talking to our minds He's saying, this is what I want you to think about, my dear and my darling brothers and sisters who I love and I long for. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, and it is going to come up, there are eight um, qualities he wants us to think about. Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, let us think about such things. Whatever you have learnt or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. And so once again, friends, he's urging us to think about what is good. Doesn't that sound beautiful, friends? It's, it's be a beautiful portion of literature, and it's true, and, and he's saying you can do this. You can think about those things rather than thinking about the things that pull you down and pull you apart and strangle you. It's not worth it. You can live, be you can live better. Um, the, it's not going to bring you any blessing. Think about these things. What is true, friends? And so 
I don't have time to go through all eight of those qualities, but I just want to take the one. I think we are a people that long for truth in our lives. We want to know the truth because the truth sets us free. The truth sets us free from all our rubbish and all our disorders and all our fa failures and all our frailties and all our humanness. The truth sets us free. So what is truth, friends? Just a few things from this book. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are part of a royal family. We eagerly await our Savior and his coming is imminent. He is near. He's near to you and he's near to me. His peace guards your mind like a soldier guarding a place. God has exalted, he's been exalted to the highest place. Government, <laughs> the only true government is upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ. Every knee is going to bow before our Savior. He is called a wonderful counselor. He is our wonderful counselor. He is our mighty God. He is our Prince of Peace and our everlasting Father. So that's just a way of it. Just thinking about the things that are true. And you can go on and do a study and think about the things that are pure and lovely and admirable and worthy of praise. It's a wonderful exercise. Perhaps even in situations that you're facing that are bringing you anxiety. Perhaps take that to God and say, God, what, can I, what is true here? What is lovely here? What is praiseworthy here in this situation? And then Paul says, whatever you've learned... <laughs> received, seen, or heard in me, put it into practice. Quite, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that, <laughs> but Paul did, but he did, he led, like Jesus, he did exemplify sacrificial love, didn't he? He lived, he was concerned for others, he was in, he, his heart was to give, not to get, not to receive, his heart was a heart of love, not hatred. And uh, he, Paul is saying here, you know what? Don't imitate citizens of another country because <laughs> you, are, you are citizens of heaven. Imitate me <laughs> because I am trying with, all my, I'm trying with all my heart and all my soul to embody what I have learned from God. So imitate me. And then to end off this little portion it ends with peace, and our God of peace will be with you. And so that is the portion that we are, and I think there's only probably another one or two sessions of Philippians left, but I trust that um, truth has, you have received truth, and that the truth would transform you and me today, because we need it, don't we? Bless you, Red Point. Bless you, visitors. And uh, thank you.